Wow. Oh, we just rose to how many people inside? We have 21. 21 people. So it's Claire, Ethan, Luke, Sung, Dana, Emily, Cody, Matthew, Lila, Tracy. Hello, Shelby. If you just got in, we'd love to know where you're from. Um, that would be awesome. Finicky. Um, I, I hope I'm not butchering your names though. <laughs> Parker. <laughs> um, Melanie. Oh, Cody's from Massachusetts, says. Um, Sydney's from Georgia. Um, Lila is from Dunwoody High School. Um, Madison is from Cayman Islands. Shelby says hello from Florida. Dimitri is also from Cayman Islands. Matthew is from Southwest Miami Senior High. Awesome. Parker Lee is from Memphis. Hello. Hannah, same here. Cayman. Okay. One is using iPad. Um, it's from California. Um, Lori Mayo is from New York. And then who is yeah. it? Um, What's really cool, my daughter, her AP Lang, some of her friends are here from Fairport, New York. So my oh. daughter, Ava Kuhn, is in the house. There she is. <laughs> Hello, Ava. Say hi. Nice to meet you as well. So I got to be on my best behavior because my daughter is uh, learning from uh, from the dad. All right. You... <laughs> so Marcus is from Wor Worcester. And... 14076. Ooh, it's a coded name. <laughs> it's from Florida. So we welcome you guys. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. And again, I'm RJ and I do the housekeeping together with Christian here. So while Christian is holding the masterclass, I'll be the one who's going to accommodate your questions. And if you've got any, don't hesitate to put them down on the chat. And um, I'll volley it to Christian for you and have them answered and clarified. And later on in the, in one of the segments, we're allowing to open your mics and ask the questions yourselves if you've got any. So that's it. So I guess, Christian, you could take it away from here and do your magic. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Well, the other day we did this for AP Lit and I had some technical difficulties. So let me confirm with RJ. Can you see my screen? FRQ1 2021, that, that pop up? Yes, it's popping up. Okay. And it's everything's changing? Yes, confirm. Okay. All right. Because that was embarrassing. <laughs> so we did this for, for Lit the other night and uh, my, my slides weren't... Uh, uh, visible on your end, but I could see them. So I was just talking in the ether. So, well, welcome. So many of you I know, and some of you are uh, students that have probably seen me uh, uh, on my YouTube channel. So welcome. It's a pleasure to be doing this for you all tonight. So what I will do is this. We're going to dissect, we're going to deconstruct each of the FRQs from last year's 2021 exam. And I'm kind of thinking I'm going to go out of order a little bit. I'm going to start with FRQ1, which is the synthesis, and we'll break down that prompt. And then what I will do is show you how, um, my, how I teach my students to manipulate and pull the strings of my template to construct the introductory paragraph and then the body paragraph. And here's what I'm hoping. At the end of the night, especially for the students and uh, even for the teachers to see this, that you can write each FRQ with the exact same template. So what we do for FRQ one with regards to the introductory paragraph, you can do it for two, you can do it for three. And then uh, I know a lot of students go from Lang to Lit and um, all of the literary analysis papers uh, for AP Lit, you can use my templates. So uh, follow me on YouTube. Um, 
you know, the teachers, uh, you have my Facebook group and uh, I'm always uploading and uh, updating information there. So what I think we can do is this, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And then at the end of my presentation on each FRQ, we'll pause, I'll hand the mic over to RJ and uh, we'll field questions. So uh, just feel free to drop those in. So let's start with last year's FRQ1, handwriting instruction in today's school. So here is the prompt, just to refresh our memories. In the 19th and most of the 20th centuries, handwriting instruction, print and cursive, was virtually universal in schools in the United States. By contrast, little if any time is devoted to such lessons today. While some argue that handwriting instruction should still have a place in schooling, others maintain that digital technologies have rendered such instruction unnecessary. So here's what we gotta do. Carefully read the following six sources, including the introductory information for each source. And then we're gonna write an essay that synthesizes material from at least three of the sources and develop your position on the place, if any, of handwriting instruction in today's society. All right, so one of the things I always say to teachers, and this is, you know, just for my teachers in the audience, this idea that you got to Bob Ross your instruction if you're going to show this to your uh, use my templates with your with your students. So what I mean by that is this it's kind of a quirky way of saying you're the expert teacher, you're the expert writer paint with your students. So in order for templates to work and for them to really sink in conceptually, um, I find that when teachers write with their students and show them plenty of exemplars and models, that the learning really kind of Velcros itself a little better. So, you know, when Bob Ross comes onto the screen and says, hello, happy little people, today we're going to paint a beautiful New England autumnal landscape and in the center of our canvas, we're going to include a New England wood covered bridge, right? He gets right up to that easel, right up to that canvas, and he shows us how to do it. And I have like, I'm completely inept as, a, as, a, as an artist. I can approximate what Bob Ross is doing and um, have a painting that somewhat resembles him. And that's true of our struggling and emerging writers. They will grow and mature and progress over time with our modeling and with our, uh, with our templates. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is this, how do I write the introductory paragraph? And it's this simple. I give my students two options. You can declare the thesis or you can invert the thesis. And if you declare, you're gonna begin with the thesis. So literally your thesis can say, you know, if we break it down simply like just basic rhetorically, what can we do? You can say yes to handwriting instruction no, or you qualify it. So those are kind of, you know, the directions that you go. So if you're going to declare just out of the gate, boom, drop something about handwriting instruction, take a stance. And I always tell my students, say it concisely, say it emphatically, right, with gusto, right, because you're arguing. From there, it's context and background, you got to situate it. And then a big thing that I really teach my students is tier two level vocabulary. So I do something uh, called a word study academy all year long with my students. And by tier two, I simply mean your average run of the mill SAT level cal caliber word. You're writing for an audience and it's really important that you have that academic diction. You know, the college boards used to say that come time of the exam, that they wanted their test takers to, you know, read, write, think, and speak like college sophomore English majors. And that comes with a certain, you know, tongue you have to, you have to have in terms of your vocabulary. So the other thing is sentence constructs. You're going to see my students with their um, exemplars and models that they've written. Um, they can manipulate their syntax really well. One of the things I do over the course of the year is a nuance academy. And I borrowed um, the, an idea from Strunk and White. They wrote a book called Write It Right, that there's 12 different ways to write a single sentence. 
And I have some YouTube videos on that. Again, just get in my channel and you can scope that out. So you're going to see my students have nice voice rhythm and flow because the tendency for a lot of AP students is to go short, simple declarative sentence, short, simple declarative sentence, short short, simple declarative sentence. So it's very chop, 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 chop in terms of the flow. And then the kicker is it's going to be four sentences long. No more, no less. Your introduction is going to be always four sentences long with my template until you master it. You can flip it and go inverted. And in this case, you're going to end with the thesis. So sometimes students might begin with a analogy, a hook, context, background. And again, you're gonna sprinkle in your tier two, focus on those sentence constructs, keep it exactly four sentences long. So let's take a look at a couple here. So this is just some random student in Mr. Kuhn's class. This is what they did. And my guys actually wrote these last week. So these are uh, their, their examples. Handwriting is an indispensable skill set and should therefore be included in every district's curriculum. Do you see how that answers the, the thesis? That's the thesis. We've answered the question. So you go yes, no, or qualify. So this one's declarative. So look at the rest of the moves here, and I'll, I'll take it from the top again. Handwriting is an indispensable skill set and should therefore be included in every district's curriculum. In order to be functionally and socially literate, one must possess the fundamental traits of basic schooling. Handwriting instruction is not something that society has outgrown. It is an integral part of how we as people communicate and operate within our society. As such, the question as to whether or not this type of instruction should be included in a child's learning is a, moot, is a moot point. So you can see here, it's thesis, context, background. Note the vocab. You don't have to be, a, I tell my guys, don't be a goon, you know, don't sound pretentious, don't sound contrived, but good words. And this kid's in his wheelhouse, like things like indispensable, you know, is a good word. Socially literate, integral. Um, so um, moot is a, is, is a nice word, fundamental. So you don't need to overdo it. You got to stay in your wheelhouse so you're not contrived, you're not pretentious. You know, you don't want to sound like, you know, a Harry Potter character or something of that nature. Um, so you stay in your range. But note the sentence constructs. So you have that first sentence, short, simple declarative, and then look where the comma is in the next. And then the kid uses a hyphen, as such, comma. So my guys are doing that to get their voice rhythm and flow. So out of the gate, that's exactly four sentences, clearly articulated thesis. Let's take a look at one more. In order to consider oneself to be fully functionally literate, handwriting instruction must be a staple of every curriculum. And ta-da, here we have it again, another declarative. The kid out of the gate dropped the thesis. Do you see how succinct he is? Or if she, he, I don't remember who wrote it. But you know, you don't want to tap dance around it. You're arguing, right? So pump your chest, argue. This is not a debate of whether or not schools are teaching antiquated practices. It is a matter of teaching to the whole student. In order to be fully literate and operate as such in our society, one needs knowledge of basic handwriting instruction. Everything from checks to negotiating contracts requires the skill set. So two for two done the exact same way. So this kid's vocab is nice again. The sentence constructs are nice. Um, uh, good vocab. A clearly articulated thesis, context, background, but no, we're not quoting from the articles. We're not paraphrasing, or not the art, the sources. We're not paraphrasing the sources. We're not quoting the sources. We're not stealing a thesis from any of the sources because the directions are very clear on that. So you really want to avoid doing those things. So it's 100% pure thesis. You don't even need to get into the reasons at all up top in that introductory paragraph. So here's another one. Let me move my pictures off of here. No matter the advantages technologies ma technology makes in our lives, there is no substitute for knowing basic literacies. 
Sure, much of society's work is conducted through a few clicks of a keyboard, but this does not mean that handwriting instruction has lost its relevancy. Schooling definitely needs to involve and meet the changing times, but we are still in an era where fundamental literacies like knowing cursive still come into play on pretty much a daily basis. For these reasons, so we got to answer the question, right? So the, the, we got to answer it first or last. The student is doing it last. So listen how they answer the, the prompt. For these reasons, handwriting instruction should be a staple of every district's curriculum. So that's an example of inverted. The thesis came last. So it doesn't really matter. So you lead with it or you end with it. Here's something I've noticed in my crotchety 20 years of teaching. Really good writers can easily invert. So they have no problem doing that whatsoever. Students who, you know, like a lot of my students who, who they're like, I'm a math, I'm a science kid, I'm no good at English. They tend to declare, and it really doesn't matter. One's not more skillful than the other, you know. Um, it's a matter of getting the job done and staying disciplined and following those nuanced things of the tier two, the sentence constructs, and really making sure that you've hammered home a thesis. Uh, that's, uh, that's half the battle. So that's an inverted one. And let's take a look at this student. Sometimes education gets stuck in the ruts of time-worn thinking. So I read that and I'm anticipating this kid better get to the thesis down below then because that didn't answer the question, right? That's not a yes, a no, or a qualify. So I'm anticipating an inverted thesis. Change can be a scary thing for some, but arguing for the continuance of a practice just because it has existed since the one-room schoolhouse is laughable. Let's face it. Kids today do not need to learn how to write in cursive in order to be considered functionally literate. As such, especially since our technological advancements have rendered it unnecessary, compulsory handwriting instruction should not be occurring in our schools. So that's inverted. The thesis came last sentence, right? And I like this one. So again, good vocab, good sentence constructs. Um, this one's kind of spunky. I like this. This kid goes, let's face it, hyphen, you know, like they're arguing. So my kids, um, you know, I, I, I teach them how to, you know, do those little pizzazz things. Some, some, some people find it cheesy and it can be, but we we're experimenting. So we were just reviewing and, uh, the kid tried it out and nonetheless, it's a pretty decent thesis. So that is the, um, introductory paragraph. So four, all done the same way. You either declare or invert four sentences, sentence constructs, tier two. So the next question we need to ask ourselves is this, how do I write the body paragraphs? And over my 20 year career, I've developed and honed, invented something that I call the syllogistic body paragraph. Every single body paragraph a kid ever writes so, and I'll prove it to you tonight. If it's for rhetorical analysis, literary analysis, argument, persuasion, synthesis, research, it does not matter. Every paragraph can be written uh, syllogistically. And um, it's a pretty neat template. So we'll break it down for you. So I have, if you want to do like some real big deep dives into this, um, again, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I have quite a bit on there. I could do like a five hour lecture on the syllogistic method. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm gonna scratch the surface of it. So some of you teachers might wanna go a little deeper, contact me, YouTube, uh, email, we can, we can get into it. So in a nutshell, in brief, the syllogistic method comes from uh, Aristotle. So it's from the Aristotelian tradition. And Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum and the rich aristocratic boys would go there. Girls were not allowed back then. And they would learn things like polemics, oration, debate, basically word wrangling. Think about like, like lawyer school uh, would be a, a, a comparable um, scenario. And some of you may be familiar with um, some Aristotelian work like Plato's Republic. And what they would do is throw out essential questions. 
And Plato's Republic is this book where they, they toy around with the question of what is justice? And these philosophical think tankers come to the mic and they're like, this is what justice is. And then they drop the mic and they're like, ah, I have the most superior definition of justice. And then the other guys get around and they're like, that's a bad definition of justice. I got a better one. You go to the mic. And it's just the whole book is go to the mic, drop your definition, et cetera. And Aristotle is very much like composition teachers in the sense where he said, geez, some kids are really good at sustaining their line of reasoning. Some kids are meh, and some kids just can't sustain their line of reasoning very well. But I know they're all smart. You know, they have good noodles. What can I do to help them sustain their line of reasoning? And he noticed that the kids who could like really articulate, he used the word cogent, which just means logical, like really, really mathematical, computative, lockstep logic, co cogent. Um, that those kids would argue syllogistically. And what he meant by that was this, it's like a math formula where you go premise, premise, conclusion. So if you say something like arsenic is deadly, and we're like, yeah, it's true. That's, uh, I don't wanna eat that stuff. And then you say, my dog ate arsenic. We're all going to conclude naturally, your dog's probably gonna die. You know, so that's that's what a basic syllogism is. So if I were to say um, any 38 year old or older non felon born in the U.S. can run for the presidency. Second premise: James is 42 non felon born in the state of Rhode Island. Conclusion: James can run for the presidency. So when we write, we got to be that bulletproof in our in our in our thinking. So in terms of writing synthesis. This is what the syllogistic method is going to look like. We're looking for an argument that states a why reason. So in the first premise, you have to state an argument that contains a why reason. So up top in the thesis, all we did was say yes, no, or it depends. Now we have to say why. Why are you saying cursive or, or that handwriting instruction should be compulsory? Why are you saying it shouldn't be compulsory? And why are you saying, why are you qualifying it? So you state your why reason. The second premise is gonna be textual support. And it's the teeter-totter balance between quoting and paraphrasing. And then the conclusion, and I really wanna be clear on this, it's the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, not the conclusion paragraph of the essay, is the textual analysis. And I tell my students that, the that you know, basically the first premise is a promise. In the conclusion, you go shake hands back and say, I'm going all the way back to the thesis, all the way back to the prompt, full circle, because that's what a syllogism does. So let's take a look at an actual example here. Students often say this to me. They say, Mr. Kuhn, you got some, you got some tricks up your sleeve. If, if introductory paragraphs are always four sentences long and we're using templates, how many sentences should a syllogistic body paragraph be? And there is a magic answer to that. I, I, I like paragraphs to be about 10 sentences long. And I put a cap on my students at 12. So if you go over 12, you tend to break your line of reasoning or you bring in all this extraneous bird walk stuff that is unnecessary. So 10 to 12, those little itty bitty four, five, six sentence body paragraphs that students are writing, there's just not enough support and analysis in there to substantiate the argument. So, all right, so some more numbers at you. First premise is always going to be three sentences long. And here's the reason why. College Board emphasizes this three times in the directions. Your argument must be central. One of the cardinal sins in synthesis is that kids start quoting too early. You begin to paraphrase and quote the articles too early. And therefore, you don't have a thesis anymore. You're just regurgitating articles. It's like you read and you're vomiting back. So it's no longer your argument. So if you take three sentences to set up your why, then you're clearly articulating an argument. So look at what, what this kid did here. Sometimes it can be dangerous to argue that just because something has been done a certain way for generations, one should continue to operate in the same manner. With regards to contemporary educational practices, 
this type of thinking is very dangerous. Today's notion of what it means to be literate is very different from the literacies of our parents and grandparents. So therefore, the face of education should look very different. So when I workshop with my students, I get to the end of the first premise and I say, hey, buddy, put that in a promise. What are you promising your reader? So what should we expect to see here? And there's certain things that are articulated there, right? We're expecting to see certain things. Now, all the quotes and all the paraphrases should be linked to that promise. Otherwise, we're going to have logical fallacies. We're going to have a break in the line of reasoning. So if we're not talking about the literacies of our parents and grandparents and the changing face of education, it does not belong in the syllogism. So starting with the fourth sentence, we begin the second premise. And I tell my students, get right into your sources. Go get the best quote you possibly can to prove that. So look where the kid goes. But as is clear in looking at this debate over a long span of time, those that chime in often make projections onto squiggles and loops that in the end yield false arguments for keeping handwriting instruction around. And it's from Trubeck. So we got a quote. And all this is, is you're quoting, you're paraphrasing, you're analyzing one, two, three, right? And you know, you got to use a few of the sources. So let's keep going. Given that technological advancements are overshadowing the need for this particular literacy to be taught, some purists push back and suggest that now more than ever, one must learn these antiquated practices it is easy to concede that handwriting instruction can aid in cognitive and motor skill development along with brain development and memory, but one needs to ask if these skills can be taught in more modern ways. As pot notes, one can easily make the argument that each school age child should play the original Super Mario Brothers to help develop fine motor skills, but this would be an admittedly awesome waste of time. Right. So now right, we got a couple of sources in here. The kid didn't put the actually they did. They said pot. So it's fine. So one of the things that my students do well, hopefully at this stage of the game, like six days before the exam, is their quote transitions are smooth. I want them to quote as if they're conversing. I don't want to hear the quote. And there's an easy hack for that. It's kind of a cheat code. I call it the five word rule. If you place a minimum of five words, not exactly, but a minimum of five words in front of a quote and keep the quote relatively small, it should sound conversational, right? So we don't, we don't want to do any of those quote dumping things. That doesn't, that doesn't sound good, especially in synthesis. So you quote, you got to analyze it. School systems that make curriculum choices need to acknowledge that modern people don't use cursive and educational systems should stop pretending they do. In order for schooling to be more meaningful, schools need to more closely mirror society. And as source F clearly indicates, schools are way off the mark. No other place but school has that degree of handwriting going on. All right, so we got a number of sources in there. We're pretty good. Let's go back for a second. Are all those quotes linked to that promise? I'll admit one wasn't. And if you were able to find that you're on the mark. So the kid broke his, she broke her line of reasoning a little bit, a little bit. I'll admit that. But overall, it's staying pretty connected. Everything, I, I use the word germane. It's relevant, right? It's all connected. In the end, you got to link it all back to the prompt, all back to the thesis statement. So look at how this links. Doing things the same way and expecting different results is a form of insanity. The times have changed and schools need to admit this fact and adjust accordingly. There's little to no need, especially given modern uses of technology, to continue to teach handwriting in its traditional fashion. So it echoes the thesis. That sounds just like the thesis, right? So a syllogism comes full circle. So that, in a nutshell, is a real quick uh, micro glance at um, how to do the declarative, inverted, and syllogistic for FRQ1. So I'm going to turn it over to RJ, who's been monitoring the chat, 
And uh, if there are any questions, I'll do my best to field those now. Yeah. Awesome, Christian. Thanks. Um, I actually got... Oh, okay. The only question we have here is the access to the meeting uh, later on, and which I've already answered. Um, uh, we'll be uploaded to YouTube, but uh, we'd love for you guys to field in your questions. Um, or I want my dog. I want my daughter to ask a question. <laughs> that would that would make my evening. No pressure. So is there anything, maybe I just did a super job explaining things. I'm like in a lucid zone tonight. Cool. You guys sure everything is clear? We'd just like to make sure that before we move forward to the next section. Uh, every, okay. Ava, <laughs> Ava finally filled in her question. Hey, seriously? Ava Kuhn. <laughs> What's Ava's question? Um... Eva says, does this format work for every essay? It does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it here right now. Okay. Dana yep. also asked, for the synthesis essay, can we have students write their position statement first, then read the sources? Um, yeah, I, 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 I tell my guys, you know, like, you, I, I, you know, I, I said this today to my guys. I was like, if you guys got to know yourself as learners. You know, they were asking me, you know, like what, what order should I write my essays? And I'm like, you're the test takers, man, figure it out. You know? So, um, I, I don't know. I, I have, a, I have a very systemized way of doing things, uh, for me personally as a test taker, but, um, you know, students figure it out. We've practiced so much all year long that, um, um, I know a number of my kids, uh, want to start with FRQ three, and then go back to one and then finish with rhetorical analysis. I don't know why they just want to. And I'm like, you got, you got two hours, you know, so figure it out. It's, it's totally up to you. So okay. they'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Let, let us know Dana, if that answered your question for you, if that's clear. Uh, now moving forward to Matthew's question, when using the syllogistic method, what is more important? using more paraphrasing or coding? I tell my guys to teeter-totter balance it, to balance it. Don't do one so much more uh, at the exclusion of the other. So it really, it really should be in balance with each other. And that's an awesome question. Like that's a really, really good question. Okay. So try to keep it all sort of in balance. Okay. Marcus is asking, should you try to make your thesis as nuanced as possible? As new? Nuanced. Nuance. Um, well, I've had my guys since September 7th. And we've, we, you know, we did went through our portfolio. And um, I'm, I'm a different beast as a teacher. So um, because with my alternative grading methods and things of that nature, we did 39 essays this year. That's insane. Like we did 39 essays. So we practice, 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 practice. And uh, my guys experiment with, um, so like we do exercises where we actually practice using colloquial and vernacular expressions with academic, because to get up into that five, six ter territory on the rubric, you got to do some amazing things with your voice. And um I tell my kids, like, I want you to walk into that exam center, you know, on, uh, on May 10th, like you're the original hipster, like you're, you're, you're the first 17 year old kid that walked into a coffee house and said, a latte sounds good. And like you invented the latte, like you are the original hipster, you know, so you have to have a voice in order in order in, in order to do that. So some of my kids, even even though they they're 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 too I, I I use the word pedantic. They're too they 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 sound too academic. Some kids don't have a high enough vocab at all. It's too small. They sound very like thirteen, you know, when they when they write. And some kids have it just right. So it's just a matter of practice and reading and uh putting it all together okay 
Thanks for that. Hope, Marcos, uh, that answered your question as well. Let us know in the comments. Um, Dana, ah, Dimitri is asking, is the first premise where you state your opinion and the second where you support it with a quote or with the information provided? Uh, first premise is your opinion. Yep. So your why reason. And then um, the second premise is uh, your sources. Yep. Your paraphrase, your quote. Uh, yep, where you're drawn from the sources. Okay. Shelby, in a 10 sentence paragraph about how many quotes or paraphrasing do you recommend? Um, my guys usually quote about three times um, in, in theirs, in, in, in each one. But yeah, typically three is kind of our magic number. Okay. Hannah is asking Is the exam only going to be essays or will there be multiple choices? There's multiple choice. Yep. So that's the first part. Okay. Awesome. Hope you hope uh, that answered the question as well. And if you yep. have any more questions, just uh, uh, put them on a chat. And going once. All right. Let me queue up my um, next slide. And is that visible? FRQ three perfection. Yes. Okay, everything is fluid tonight. So I'm skipping to FRQ3 because rhetorical analysis is kind of its own beast. We're still going to use the um, declarative and inverted and syllogistic for rhetorical analysis. But the fact of the matter is you got to read and analyze that passage and use your, your terms and devices, which is uh, a little bit different. So um, FRQ3 literally writes itself the exact same way as FRQ1. The only difference is we're taking your sources away. You've read nothing. And what's coming is from your head. So the second premise is all from your head, right? And I'll model that for you. So the, the introduction is going to write itself the exact same way. And then the only difference is the second premise. And it's actually, this is it's really easy. This is super, super easy to do. So here's the prompt from last year. Many people spend long hours trying to achieve perfection in their personal or professional lives. Similarly, people often demand perfection from others, creating expectations that may be challenging to live up to. In contrast, some people think perfection is not attainable or desirable. Write an essay that argues your position on the value of striving for perfection. So you have to take a position on the value of striving for perfection. So like do it, don't do it, or it depends, right? So that's always your rhetorical, um, you know, you're, 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 you're limited in terms of rhetorical strategies that you can take, right? So don't, uh, don't overcomplicate it. So Again, I say the same thing every time. Bob Ross these for your, uh, for your students, right? So give them some exemplars and models. And uh, same question, how do I write the introductory paragraph? Ah, we can declare or we can invert. So we can begin with the thesis, end with the thesis. Tier two sentence constructs, four sentences. So if we follow that template, I got to move our pictures again one second. We will do things like this. Some people get stymied by their fear of being less than perfect. And unfortunately, this can damn a person to being more than imperfect. Striving for perfection is futile. What one must do to achieve perfect ideals is to strive for continuous improvement. Always making forward strides in life is a lofty expectation but one can never do so perfectly. So here's the thing. If you aren't talking about perfection in your uh, introduction, you don't have a thesis. Like you have to talk about perfection. So we were doing um, the 2019 uh, FRQ3 earlier this week, I think Monday, and it was about overrated. And it's the same thing. If you're not talking about overrated and having some kind of stance and argument, some position with regards to the concept of being overrated, you don't have a thesis. So same with perfection. Take some stance on it. Have some opinion. State it first. State it last. 
context background tier two sentence constructs every single time. So you'll notice this is exactly four sentences long, right? And it's just very assertive. So you don't need to get into your reasons. Like you don't want to be talking about, you know, Kurt Cobain. You don't want to be talking about, you know, um, I don't know, Ja Morant. You, you don't want to be talking about, uh, you know, Kanye West. Like none of your textual support comes into the thesis at all. Just straight up nuts and bolts thesis. So here's another one done the exact same way. With most endeavors, perfection cannot be attained. Do you see that? This is really easy. Just boom, drop it immediately. But there's such a thing as the perfect chase for perfection. Given that perfection is an ideal detached from reality, what matters most is trying to achieve a perfect state of excellence. One cannot be perfectly perfect, but one can be perfectly excellent. So that's inverted. The thesis comes last right? And how philosophical is that, right? That's really cool. So one of the things I tell my students all the time with FRQ3, especially as you get into the second premise, is you kind of have to think about, you got thousands of kids in the nation taking this test. What are you going to say to make yourself a little different, you know, in terms of your, uh, in terms of your stance? And I like these ones here. I told my guys, I was like, just wax philosophical, scratch your chin, you know, like be profound, say something meaningful. Um, so they did okay with these. Um, this one took a really different approach and we haven't seen this yet. Um, so oftentimes teachers advise their students to start with a hook or an analogy. Um, and that's classic inverted. And you can go this way. Um, I know a lot of teachers that say, I'm not a fish. I don't need a hook. Uh, just give me a thesis statement. And my student asked me if she could start this way. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. I mean, your, your thesis comes last. You've articulated it. You're concise. It's disciplined. Uh, and it seems to work. So look, look where this goes. Members of Alcoholics Anonymous live by a simple motto. Sober living is a matter of progress, not perfection. So we can see by saying the word perfection, we're still anchored, right? If it was talking about, you know, like railroad tracks or something like that, then we were like way off in left field. Sober or not, this philosophy is very grounding, especially given that perfection is unattainable. What one should seek is success instead. One of the noblest things man can do is perfectly chase the ideas of working toward great successes in life, even if that entails running into a few failed attempts along the way. So all three done the exact same way. So withhold your textual support, right? You don't, you're, gonna, you're gonna save that for the body paragraph. It's 100% nuts and bolts thesis statement. Say it first, say it last, context, background, tier two, sentence constructs every single time. It's the exact same, exact same thing that we did for FRQ uh, one just seconds ago. Now, in terms of the body paragraphs, guess what? We are going to proceed syllogistically again. So look at that. It's the exact same thing. You're going to argue a why reason because you haven't stated your whys yet. You just stated your reason up top in the thesis. So you're gonna articulate why, why am I taking this particular stance on perfection, you know? And you just kind of state it in your three, your three sentences for the first premise. Here's the difference. Second premise comes from recall. It comes from your head. You, have, you, don't, you don't have any paper in front of you whatsoever. So as you're thinking about perfection, you know, you have to think like, hmm, history, literature, music, movies, personal experience, um, pop culture, um, social media, anything. You can use anything you want uh, for your textual support. The conclusion, again, the textual analysis are our links, promises, and echoes and we're shooting for 10 sentences. So look how this goes. 
first three sentences, I'm going to keep my argument central. I know, I know, I know, I know that the college board only says that for the synthesis essay, your argument must be central. But I tell my kids, we're doing expository writing and all expository writing is an act of argument. So you got to argue. So what kids do, unfortunately, it's a major snafu is they immediately get into their second premise and it's not, you're not arguing. You're just, you're just kind of paraphrasing something. So got to make sure you argue in the first premise. I have one word that I have to say, and it's perfection, right? And in the conclusion of my syllogism, I have one word that I have to say, and it's perfection. So kids oftentimes write FRQ3 in totally lose sight of the prompt. And I'm like, ah, no, 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 no. Get it back, get it back, get focused. So if I get anchored, I should be able to sustain my line of reasoning. So look at my first three sentences. Some of the world's most ingenious inventions that propelled humanity forward were wrought in thousands of failed attempts. If these great thinkers were to have been bogged down by the strivings of perfection, so there we go, we would be without things like the automobile, telephone, even seemingly simple things such as the fork and spoon. But the thing is, there is such a thing as perfecting the fine art of failing. All right, so let's put this first premise into a promise. I'm expecting some conversation about inventions. I wanna hear about an inventor. That seems to fit. And this inventor, if we're gonna hold the line of reasoning, uh, failed a lot, but had some really killer successes. If we're talking about anything else, we're gonna break our line of reasoning and uh, have logical fallacies. So I can't go on and on and on and on and on and on about this inventor and his failures and his successes and things. I, you know, I'm a hard cap at 12, 12 sentences. So I got to um, be really focused. Fourth sentence begins the second premise. Immediately get into your textual support. Do you remember how in synthesis we started quoting? It's kind of the same way, get right into it. An excellent example of this is Thomas Edison. He was one of the most successful inventors in American history, commonly referred to as the Wizard of Menlo Park. A larger than life figure who seemed to be able to construct miraculous things from cosmos of his mind. But the man also stumbled, sometimes tremendously. In response to a question about his missteps, Edison once said, I've not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. And the student had that quote from their head. She memorized that quote. So she didn't do any Google search or anything like that. So usually you're not quoting. From a historical perspective, most people are not aware of Edison's botched inventions. He would sometimes spend years turning the gears of one of his brain children, but to no avail in the end. Perfection is a matter of perspective. Edison did not hang his head and give up. He instead looked at the snags of his efforts and said, let's keep trying. By the end of his life, he had 1,093 inventions, including the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and the light bulb. In essence, his efforts gave birth to 1,093 inventions that spawned from endless failures. So here's the deal. I have one word that I tell my students all the time for the second premise, and they're tired of me saying it. They can't wait for the exam so that I, they never hear me say this. Specificity. You have to be specific, right? So this kid knew numbers like 1093, phonograph, motion picture, light bulb, right? They have some dates. That helps. The more specific you are, the better off you're going to be. So we were doing, um, oh, geez, what were we doing? Um, I'm, draw, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I, I think it was the 2017 um, FRQ3. And one of my students for his um, uh, second premise took the topic racism. And I'm like, dude, like racism, that's huge. Like that, like you, you only have seven, eight sentences and you're going to tackle racism. 
or you take something like the civil war or civil rights. It's like, no, 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 specific. How about John Brown Harper's Ferry? You know, um, get like really into the minutia and the nitty gritty detail of something. So you don't want to be too global. You don't want to be too broad, but really hone in on the specifics. So the conclusion, just like FRQ1, just takes a couple of sentences. I know that I have to come full circle and back to the prompt. So gots to gots to gots to gots to say perfection. I have to say something about Edison and perfection. Had Edison been of the mindset whereby he sought the perfect ideals of perfection, his name would have been forgotten many years ago. But instead, his legacy lives on because he recognized that failure can be a perfect impetus for creation and success. Traits like tenacity that allow one to never give up are perfect, but striving for perfection in all endeavors is a futile pursuit. Echo the thesis, take it right back. And um, that's how you would do the um, uh, syllogism for uh, FRQ3. So one question I know I'm going to get, so I'm going to be preemptive and beat you to the chase. My students do four paragraphs for all three essays. So intro, two bodies, and a conclusion. So my student would have to come up with another um, paragraph here. All you do, switch the second premise. So come up with a different example. So um, I know some students did um, Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, I, I got a lot of boys this year uh, in my class, lots of sports. Um, um, you know, LeBron James, Cal Ripken Jr., um, you know, striving for perfection. Um, I had one girl write about failing her driver's test six times. Um, yeah, so I'll turn it back to RJ. Go for it, RJ. What do we have? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? Mm hmm Okay. Yes. Um, Luke is asking, what does tier two mean in the intro paragraph? Uh, tier two just means, tier two level vocabulary means um, like SAT caliber level uh, word. So academic diction, academic vocabulary. Mm, okay. Marcus is asking two questions. Uh, first one, what are your thoughts on deductive arguments with the theses in the conclusion paragraph? Totally fine with it. Totally fine. So I have a colleague uh, who um, uh, does it all the time, and uh, it works. And um, uh, it's uh, it's it's actually a really good way. So uh, many of you guys know. I don't know if I, I'm assuming a teacher asked that question. So that sounded like a teacher question. Tim Tim Freitas and I uh, are going to be collaborating on a textbook together. So the Garden of English guy. So probably most of you know him. And we were talking uh, a couple of months ago as we were as we were putting our heads together on this, the idea that there's many ways to skin the compositional fish. You know, good writing is good writing. How you get there, it doesn't matter. So those of you that are familiar with Tim's templates uh, know that they're very different in many ways than my templates. But in the end, good writing is good writing. It doesn't it doesn't really matter uh, at all. But I'm big on teaching my students um, uh, all the basics about reasoning. I do a, a, a big, big crash course in the beginning of the year on inductive and in deductive reasoning. We spend a lot of time on, on um, uh, logic. So it's a good question. And, and it's, it's, it's worth my money. Um, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on that. It helps with line of reasoning. Next question is, again, from Marcus, should you always look to include a counter argument in your line of reasoning? Oh, uh, my kids do uh, often do that. Yes. Okay. Somewhere in the essay, especially, yeah, for uh, synthesis and um, FRQ3, it's not essential, but um, if they get trapped, I'm like, just counter argue you know, get yourself, get yourself out. I was working with a kid today and he was just like, I have nothing to say. You know, I don't know what to do in my uh, second body paragraph. I'm like counter argue, 
you know, like do a, do a refutation. Um, so those are, those are easy strategies and it's a, uh, it's a great way to argue. Okay. Um, that's the last of the question for this segment, actually. Do you have any okay. more questions? Or should I Christian do. proceed? Oh, so. Are we good? Yes, yes, we're good. Okay. All right. So can you see that Barack Obama dedication to Rosa Parks? Yes. All right. Everything is flawless tonight. No technology issues. Boo yeah. So this was the prompt for uh, the rhetorical analysis. And uh, um, let's take a look. On February 27, 2013, while in office, former President Barack Obama delivered the following address dedicating the Rosa Parks statue in the National Hall of the U.S. Capitol building. Rosa Parks was an African-American civil rights activist who was arrested in 1955 for refusing to give up her seat on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Read the passage carefully write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices Obama makes to convey his message. So rhetorical analysis is, is a whole other beast. And um, it's really, um, you know, my, my, my students are realizing the writing's gonna take care of itself for my students because we've been using these templates since September 7th. Uh, I got them the day after Labor Day. Uh, in New York State, that's when we start. And to make things really, really, really simple, I tell my students that um, uh, for rhetorical analysis, I only want them to declare. So we just keep it really easy. And once my students have mastered the declarative, I'm like, I'll show you the inverted, right? So, because this is this this gets really kind of slippery. So again, we're four sentences, varied sentence constructs, tier two vocab, and um, one of the things that my students do is this. So I have this poster in my room, and uh, we add to this all the time. It's like a little Velcro poster, and we read and read and read all year long, lots of short little passages. And I tell my guys, there's only so many things you can do rhetorically. So speech after speech, passage after passage, we're gonna see recurring terms and devices just over and over and over again, in the sense that, you know, and again, some of you are really familiar with my work. The other day we were working on, um, the Marge Simpson letter to uh, Barbara Bush. And somebody said, geez, the pronoun manipulation here is exactly what we saw with the Gandhi speech. And I'm like, yes, yes, that's it. So you should begin to see recurring um, terms and devices just servicing over and over and over again, because there's only so many things you can do um, rhetorically to um, you know, create meaning, to construct meaning. So these are our, our list of the high flyer words that often uh, recur. Now, when we read and do our like Plato's Plato discussions, our Socratic seminars, our fish bowls, our Harkness discussions, however we're unpacking this, if I'm helping students, for the introduction, we always like to put up on the board, I call, I use the word salient. So the most important, what are the three most salient terms and or devices? And if you look at this list, like some of them just repeat over and over again. So we know in Mr. Kuhn's class that usually in the introductory paragraph, you got to say something about the tone. Like that's a gimme. Like that's, that's just, that's just always seems to be there. You got to talk about ethos, pathos, logos that might not go in the intro, but you know, you got to look for it. And then syntax, tone, and diction. So that's just kind of a gimme. So what we do, I'm looking for my slide here. I lost it. I lost it. Um, what we do is um, begin with what we deem to be the most important rhetorical term and or device and then the context and background we're putting in the other two. So my students will always mention three terms and or devices in their uh, thesis. And uh, I left a slide out here, I realized, but that's okay. We can, we can do without it. 
All right, let me move my picture around here. So this student, when I conferenced with him, said, I think the most important term is tone. And I said, all right, let's roll with it. But my students know something. Tone, I use the word monolithic, which means like one rock. It's one side of the rock. When you're analyzing tone, tone it's like a, a rock. You got to turn it over and look at all the angles. So Obama's got a couple of tones working in this. And I always tell my students, identify two tones. And it's really a good idea if you can, you know, for the sake of keeping yourself academic, um, to use at least one tier two level word to identify the tone. So this kid said reverent and appreciative. So reverent is a really nice word and it's a bingo word. It's like, yes, man, that's awesome. That's like exactly a crisp word to describe Obama's tone. So look, look where he goes here. Through a reverent and appreciative tone, Obama celebrates the legacy of Rosa Parks during his address. So we got tone. In acknowledging that Parks paved the way for him and other African-Americans to take prominent seats in public life, Obama through, look at the second one, anecdote, highlights that no matter one status, anyone can be an agent of change. Through his, here's number three, elongated sentence structure and repetition, Obama further champions the idea that even though much change has occurred, much more still needs to happen. His biblical illusions also advance these ideas. So that, uh, in a nutshell, is how my guys do it. And I, 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 I realize I left a very important slide out here. When we are analyzing uh, rhetoric or literature, so any literature, and a lot of you guys chimed in uh, last week for the lit uh, webinar that I did, you're ultimately asking and answering two questions. What is the authorial intent, right? What is the author's intent? So maybe your teachers used the word exigence before, right? What's the purpose? Why did Obama give this speech? What was his purpose? What was his thesis, right? So that's another way of saying it. In my students' introductions, they answer that question. And then the second question is this, how does the author construct meaning? And that's where you're gonna use your terms and devices, right? So I asked the student, why did you include biblical allusions in the end? And he said, because there's so much going on in this, I felt limited at three. And I'm like, that's the glory of a template, right? It's not confining. You're not like restricted. It's not there to stymie you. So the kid made the choice. Like, I really need to get the biblical illusion in there, uh, in the space with the thesis. And I was like, that's totally cool. It's fine. But you can see tier two level vocab. Sentence constructs are varied. There's good voice rhythm and flow. They've identified the salient terms. They went four instead of three. It's no big deal. And it's exactly four sentences long. So that one was really, really good. That was the best one out of my, my batch. Let me show you another one. In contextualizing the legacy of Rosa Parks, Obama asserts that anyone of any stature can affect change. Embracing a praising and admiring tone. So you see my tone trick again, praising and admiring. He highlights the fact that Parks laid the foundation for not only Blacks, but any citizen to fight against the injustices that still exist in contemporary society. And now let's get into the terms. Through his repetition and enumeration, Obama highlights the victories and struggles that existed in the 1950s, but also today and encourages every citizen to continue Park's fight for a better tomorrow. Further, his use of biblical allusions also advanced the idea that much work still needs to be done, even though the fight goes on and is worth it. Three terms, four sentences, sentence constructs, tier two. Like ultimately it's gonna come down to, can your student, or I know I got a lot of students in here, can you the student, correctly read the um, rhetorical analysis passage. My students hated me early in the year when I told them that there was a right answer. 
that there was a right way to read and ascertain meaning because they've always been told if I can support and defend my thesis, then I'm right. And I'm like, yeah, but if you say that, you know, uh, Obama went to, you know, the Shenango County Fair and shot, you know, a bunch of clowns in the butt with a BB gun, then you're wrong. It, 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 like, that's not what the speech is about. I, I mean, I could write a whole essay and support and defend that, but I'm wrong. So, um, you know, you gotta, you know, get to, uh, you know, that construction of meaning and uh, the uh, intent uh, in order to make that fly. So here's one more. Same, same template. Look at what the student did with the tone here. With an indebted and grateful tone. See that two-tone words and it's B-I-N-G-O, like killing the tone, crushing it. Obama highlights the legacy of Rosa Parks and the worthiness of the celebration at hand. Having blazed the trails to end segregation, Obama praised Parks' life through enumeration and repetition. So they're hitting all the right terms. They've read the terms correctly. Although Parks' actions were a major catalyst for change, Obama calls upon his audience to still push forward and continue the fight that started some 50 years ago. In drawing attention to the Bible, Obama further points out that while great progress has been made, much more still needs to happen, right? And with the intent. So every single one was done the exact same way. Three salient terms, sentence constructs, tier two sentence constructs, exactly four sentences long. So that's how my guys are gonna do the introductions. The um, uh, syllogistic method, the only thing that changes here is the idea of the first premise. We're still gonna argue our why reasons, but we're gonna be using our terms uh, and or devices. So we have to be talking about that poster that we just saw, the ethos, the pathos, the logo, syntax, tone, diction, enumeration, uh, dichotomy, whatever whatever word we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna throw. The textual support goes back to that earlier question in the evening. We're gonna teeter-totter balance our quoting and our paraphrasing. And then um, our echoes, our links at the end, shooting for 10 sentences. So this gets, you know, like rhetorical analysis is so hard to teach and so hard to write, but it's really, really, really easy once you get some tricks under your belt. So one thing that my students uh, do often is they steal these first four words from me right from the onset. So students don't, I often don't know where to begin their analysis. And I say, for your line of reasoning, and just so that you have a chronology and a sequence, I, I always start where the author starts. So start where Obama starts and just go, go rhetorical term hunting. Like, what does he do? Like, right from the beginning. And take three sentences to set that up, right? Because your argument's going to be central. And this is where we get into this idea of multitasking. So since we have three sentences to play with, you know, we have, can talk about characterization. What else do we have in here? Um, anecdote, syntax, and it looks like there's gonna be some, like some ethos I think is implied in here. Otherwise, what students are gonna be tasked to do to get a whole read is one paragraph tone, one paragraph diction, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph ethos, you're going to run out of time and it's a very unskillful way to construct an essay. So that multitasking uh, takes a little practice, but it's simplified if you go chronologically, you just kind of like check your, your terms as you're going through uh, the piece. So let's see what this kid did. Right from the onset, Obama characterizes Parks as having been just an average citizen without stature or rank. But because she took action to address the injustices of her time, she left an indelible legacy. Primarily through anecdote and his syntactical arrangements, Obama sets the stage for why this American civil rights leader deserves so much attention, even 50 years after the fact. So we're three sentences in, first premise done. Fourth sentence begins the second premise, and it's the exact same template. Get into your textual support. Let's go quote. So, 
follow the line of reasoning. We are told that Rosa Parks held no elected office and that she possessed no fortune or formal seats of power, yet she will be she will go down as being one of the prominent faces that helped deliver the end of segregation. And remember what we were talking about with synthesis with that five word rule for smooth quote transitions? Kid used it right here again, right? So just keep going, plow through. Oh, and then, you know, we know that we made a promise. I forgot to say that. So we promised to talk about characterization, ethos. What was the other one? Anecdote, right? So all the quotes, paraphrases need to be germane to that. Obama says on two occasions that Rosa Parks would not be pushed and that a friend of the civil rights leader claimed that nobody ever bossed Rosa around and got away with it. This is exactly the spirit Obama encourages his audience to embrace. Although Parks was driven by a solemn determination to affirm hers and others God-given dignity, Obama reminds his audience that they likewise, likewise can equally be champions of change in a present era that is still far from perfect. In fact, his long sentence structures enumerate the long and arduous process of the fight for civil rights. Highlights For civil rights highlights this fact from line 28 to line 37. Obama delineates the struggle and the reward of never giving up the cause of combating social injustices and, and inequality. So let's just like, let's go back for a second here. Do you see how this is all connected to the first premise? All the quotes, all the paraphrases have to be connected to that first premise. Otherwise you get fallacies. You break your line of reasoning. So Teachers, this is really cool in terms of helping your students quote with deliberation, right? Sometimes, like I know when I read, um, you know, papers that kids across the nation wrote, they seem very willy nilly with how they quote. And, uh, you know, this, this template is like get methodic, get purposeful, be deliberate. His two biblical allusions also advance this idea. He suggested the audience that for now we see through a glass darkly. Even in the present moment, injustice and inequity fog the vision of what actually is. And unfortunately, as Obama notes, many people spend their time accepting injustice, rationalizing inequity, and tolerating the intolerable. All right, we got plenty of support. Like we kept that promise really nice and tight. So let's go echo that thesis. Let's take it all back. Parks, on this day to celebrate her legacy, serves as a reminder of just how to enact change. It is not by assuming high positions or amassing wealth. It is by taking action and standing up for what is right. And as Obama states, every person in this nation can follow suit. And we are done uh, with that syllogism. So we got to keep in mind though, my students write four paragraphs, intro, two bodies, conclusion. What are we going to do in the next body? Well, since we started chronologically, we're only through about the first third of the speech. So we still have the whole rest of it to go, but let's go back here, way back to this. We still have all these other terms and devices that we have to analyze. So that's coming in the um, uh, second body paragraph. And then uh, conclusions are just standard for my kids. That's a whole other workshop. So anyways, RJ. Um, there's only I, one. Went, I went over a little bit, but hopefully <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, actually, we're just in time because actually somebody was asking earlier until what time because they're actually willing to adjust their schedule just to stay with you on this until the end. So actually, uh, got clocked at 8.45, but it's totally fine. Marcus is asking, is it possible to receive a perfect score without knowing the rhetorical terms? Um... You would have to be really, I don't know. That's a kind of a kind of tricky. Trick, I think um, trick question. <laughs> yeah. Like you'd have to be very lucky. 
I think, and very good at the art of implication. So you notice like my students don't say ethos, pathos, logos. They, they say emotion. They say credibility. They use the synonym. So I don't know if you're referring to the fact that my students imply their terms a lot um, versus expressly stating them. But um, yeah, I think, yeah, if you don't know them, you probably wouldn't be able to do the analysis. So um, I think that would you'd probably kind of kind of preclude you from, from doing that. Okay. Cody is asking, can conclusions be omitted for a decent score on any of the essays? Can a conclusion be a, a what? Omitted. Um, ah. I, I, I just think like in terms of standard composition, like the paradigm of what is composition, you really need that conclusion on there. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of customary, you know, it's like, it's the, the, the cherry on top, you know, you kind of need it. I know a lot of kids run out of time and they, uh, and they don't do it. But it's one of those things like if you got the time, do it. It's 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 just a convention. And I'm I, I hate conclusions. My my students, you know, we got to like I think March 15th this year, and they're like, wait a minute, Mr. Kuhn, you've never showed us how to write a conclusion. I'm like, because I hate them. So um, but yeah, they're they they are necessary and there is a way to do them. And I, it's, it's a whole other whole other webinar. Okay. Claire is asking, what is the difference between rhetorical devices and rhetorical choices? Um, nothing really. It's just, yeah. I mean, we, I, 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 on my wall, like we list them, the choice versus the device. Um, it's, it's, it's all the same. It's all the same common fanfare. Okay. Uh, Marcus is asking still, how do you write the conclusion without sounding like you're repeating the introductory paragraph? That, my friend, is a good question. And the person that I think does it the best is my good friend, Tim Freitas, has uh, an excellent video on Garden of English um, about writing conclusions. And um, it's something that Tim and I are 100% in accord on. I have yet to make a video on it, and I probably should. I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna put that on my short list of things to do. Um, I like my guys to, um, use analogies, use comparisons, um, get into like some figurative, uh, language down in there and just take like, you know, three sentences and wrap it all up. Um, otherwise, you know, it can sound rather regurgitative, you know, re reiterative, uh, redundant, and that's just kind of, you know, composition to some extent um traditional conclusions that's why i'm not a, a, a total big fan of them but uh they are nice to see okay and if i can think of it like that's what one one thing where you know teachers have said to me like if you could really think of, of a great way to write conclusion paragraphs for essays you're going to be a million dollar a millionaire many times over and i'm like i know that i just i don't know they're kind of contrived i, I just i don't know um it's like leaving a conversation kind of awkwardly. Okay. Um, Dana is actually commenting. She says, the list of terms that you illustrated is valuable. Every class is different, and so lists will be different somewhat, but it is important to have one as a constant visual for students. How do you say that? I agree. Yep. Yep. And we just have, like, mine are little Velcro ones. And I have like a basket. And as, as we learn terms, they go up there uh, over the course of the year. So, um, you know, well, like when we came to an Afra, you know, we got in the basket and put it up. And so okay. they just get familiar with it and, uh, you know, see it over and over again. Awesome. Let me just pull in a bit quick. Okay. So, if you don't have any more questions, uh, guys, we'd love to uh, know what your biggest takeaway is from tonight's masterclass so that, you know, uh, we'll be sure that uh, we're doing the right thing <laughs> and that uh, you guys actually got something out from this. So 
Also, I think uh, this is also a good opportunity if any of you guys want to say something like your biggest takeaway that you want to share or like if you still have more questions that you want to ask. I think it's um, totally fine now to open your mics or just raise your hand so that I could unmute you. And give you the floor <laughs> to speak. So yeah. while we're waiting for people to raise their hands, um, Alicia has something to say. The biggest takeaway, I think this is, the number of sentences per premise is helpful to get to the 10-sentence paragraph. Awesome. Sydney says, academic vocab is a must throughout essays, but sounding too pretentious or basic will hurt your chances on the test. I okay. agree. Um, yeah. 14076 says, you steer two words and make sure your body paragraph aligns with your premise. And then Dana says, thank you again. I just really like the consistent use of templates. Guys, if you yeah. have anything else you'd like to say, you can now open your mics or you can raise your hands. Uh, give you the floor if you have any more questions or um, you want to share your takeaways. You can ask Ava Kuhn what it was like to grow up with a father like me. <laughs> Ava, are you here? Uh, okay. She oh. had to go. She's got oh a test goodness. tomorrow. Yeah. You have 40 people listening to you till the end of the master class. That's awesome. Cool. Okay. Hope you guys. And by the way, since we actually started the master class with just 23 people in inside. And okay. Let me just pull Christian's YouTube channel real quick because I believe he's going to um, upload the recording of this. Um, okay, just a minute. Let me pull it up. Okay, here you go. We'd love for you guys to subscribe to this channel. So I'm dropping it in the chat. It's okay. I'm putting it there repeatedly so that it won't get flooded. But it's Christian Kuhn, teachers, teaching teachers how to teach writing. So currently we have more than 4,000 people consistently watching Christian's videos and we'd love for that to grow in order for more teachers to you know to uh make better writers out of their students um and make uh, teaching a lot easier and a lot quicker um so and also we'd love for you guys to join us also in the facebook community if you're still not a part of it, who's not yet a part of the community? Because we're going, we're going four thousand strong inside as well. So let me pull up the link as well for that. Um, just a moment. <laughs> Alicia says, "I made sure not to teach my daughter in high school. My <laughs> my ki- my 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 own personal kids." Uh, I sound like I have legions of kids. I have two kids. That, that sounded so stupid. They begged for me to um, uh, teach at their high school with their friends. Uh, and uh, But uh, it's hard to uh, teach in the town where you live, I've noticed. I, very early in my career, my very first gig, I did that. And I vowed never <laughs> to do it again. Like As an example, I went to the mall. Um, which is in a totally different town this weekend to do prom dresses with, uh, with my daughter. And uh, I was like a celebrity with like all these former students and uh, my kids' friends and stuff. I couldn't shop. And the parents like, how is my daughter doing in your lane class? I'm like, I just, I, I just want to get a gown and get the hell out of here. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Oh, sorry. I think I'm. I think you're muted, Christian. Can you unmute again? Sorry. Yeah, we okay. good. Yeah, we yeah. good as well. Okay. So yeah, I just dropped the Facebook group link for you guys. So we'd love for you to become a part of the community, and uh, even grow further uh, in your teach in your uh, teaching career and. Sydney says, at this point, I'm way more advanced than mother. 
than my mother in this and she probably couldn't help me. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, I think uh, that's it for tonight. Christian, do you have anything else to uh, tell the people inside the master class before we um, call this a night? No. So, we'll be, um, I have some emails that will be coming out. We're going to be doing some programs this summer that we're putting together. And uh, I have a big announcement coming this weekend. So some some things have happened this week. So we'll uh, we'll fill you in on that in the uh, in the groups. And so let you know later on. Okay. So All Alicia right. is asking. I am feeling confident for planning next year. I think this is a question. When does the new book come out? Um, it's a mighty good question. Um, I hopefully will find out tomorrow. That yeah, that's that's like the quickest answer. So I'm hoping to find out tomorrow. Like I should. So I think I I think um, I've been um, working with a few publishers and. Uh, they're kicking my tires. I'm kicking their tires. And I think, I think if my intuition is right, that uh, tomorrow we should settle upon something. So it's really up to them. It takes, I don't know, usually it takes a few months after you've settled upon a contract and they've edited it uh, and, and revised. So I'm hoping by fall, October, November, we're going, you know, uh, Tim and Brandon and I are going to NCTE together. So I would like to have it published and, you know, available by November. That would be ideal. Okay. Awesome. So once again, thank you so much uh, for spending the night with us. And um, uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to join the community or you could actually send Christian a friend request on Facebook if you're still not connected with him and fill your questions there if you want. And that's been quite a masterclass. It's me, RJ, your housekeeper for tonight. <laughs> and thanks for, thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you again yeah. next time. All right. See you, everyone. Okay. Goodbye, folks.